You ever have one of those days where you wake up in the morning and you go through the motions and you spend the entire day doing various tasks and making various problems for yourself and you get to the end of the day, you you know, you've come home, you've had dinner, you're kind of sitting around thinking and you just realise, like, I achieved absolutely nothing today and I don't remember anything I did. Absolute net zero work day. That's this turn. To put it shortly, our preparations are continuing to go. I'm relatively confident that Pangea doesn't think I'm going to actually break my NAP, which I'm sure will come as as nasty a surprise as him flipping my entire nation in one turn did to me. But yeah, so moving my forces around, trying to get in position, I will want an army here, I want an army here, I might need to split up and break and rearrange some armies, I want my main army to come down here and bomb into his capital. Having uh, income difficulties, you might notice that our outlay is 1300 and our income is 2200. Where's that thousand gold going? Well, it's going on repeat recruitments, I think. All of these places are spending 165 gold on assorted, you know, Gigia and crones and blood drinking werewolf guys and other completely normal things for a municipality to invest in. But yeah, there really is very little to say. I'm going to retake this province, which I believe is, which which it's fine. We agreed with man that that would be fine. I think I talked about this last turn, but I have assembled the last great alliance of men and elves, by which I mean giants, fish people, the French, the English, and various other ancestral enemies of one another to go all declare war on Pangaea on the same turn, uh, which is also the turn I have broken my agreement. Well, no. The turn I have agreed to end my NAP with with Pangaea, so he thinks there's going to be problems in six turns. There's not. There's going to be problems in two or three turns. Um, I believe that I spent my entire last turn talking about that course of diplomacy, so I'm not going to go on about it now, but um, we've had a couple more like responses. Nabar says, yep, it's definitely a problem, but um, I'm, I'm concerned about Ulm. Ulm haven't gotten back to me. Um, but I did reassure him that Curtis is definitely on the side to, to try and take down Pangaea. So that really is everything we want to talk about this turn. Hello friends, it is turn 40-something, and if you hear any loud bangs on the audio track tonight, that is because it is the UK's annual Bomb the Sky Day, which commemorates uh, an interesting event 600 years ago, where a cloud was ordered to be put to death for the crime of reigning on a royal procession. Never let anyone say we aren't relentlessly quaint. Naturally, several peasants in the next county over were killed when those cannonballs came back down to earth, but you know wouldn't be a UK tradition if it didn't involve relentlessly destroying the poor. Ooh, topical. Anyway, let's actually talk about my turn. As you may be hearing my voice, I'm still unwell. I've had some kind of throat infection, which has made me sound all all hoarse and sexy. Although sexy horses can be relegated to a different YouTube channel. Not much to say about this. Good slave income. We've found, finally, another magic site. We've had a few of our provinces that we ceded been taken. We have had... We've retaken a fortress... It's not much that's happened, but this one, I believe, is a story, so we'll have to be careful about that. And we've lost a few scouts, but that's also, that's kind of fine. So I think that was this province, one of the ones around here somewhere. So it might not be a story um, event, but that's fine. Let's just try and ignore it. There's not actually that much to say, except that, wow, getting a bunch of incredibly paranoid world leaders to cooperate to take care of a single greater threat is surprisingly difficult. Surprisingly difficult. Man did definitely end his pact, but uh, he said he's getting, quote, conflicting reports, unquote, of how dangerous Pangaea is currently, and uh, therefore may not be attacking into Pangaea on the first turn possible, which is frustrating for me, because I'm not comfortable attacking into Pangaea unless everybody does, since I would be breaching my NAP. Otherwise, I'll have to wait like six turns to go to war with him, by which point he might have finished eating Marignan and be basically unassailable, because he'll be enormous at that point. He'll control something like a third or a quarter of the entire map. Mariel tells me that they are down to a third of their territory and half of their income, so they are definitely losing, but basically the fact that Mariel took this throne province away was basically a last gasp. He's just basically trying to make as much trouble as he can for Pangaea, but that means that when people come over here and they look at the statistics and they look at the thrones, they go, hmm, Pangaea has only got as many as Mariel has, and then kind of forget about the point that, um, yeah, well... If he takes both of these, he's going to have four and be poised to take several more. So, you know, I'm kind of scrabbling around trying to get diplomacy to happen, but it's not not going perfectly. 
Besides that, there's not much to say. I am going to irritatingly have to start sight searching with my god because I really need some earth gems and he's the only earth guy I have and I'm just not getting enough earth gems to be able to summon a troll king anytime soon. If I can find a few earth sites, then in a few turns, I might be able to turn enough of these into these, which is, you know, kind of bad, but whatever. Then I can summon him and then have him sight search and that'll be a lot more, you're just, just a better option really in general. Other than that, the recruitment of patrol troops is ongoing. I'm going to move my armies into position so that when I do eventually go to war with Pangaea, I can have two armies move into here and start taking a ton of territory really quickly and put down any any major armies that they find. Which reminds me, I should probably have some of my nature casters forge enormous cauldrons of broth, since the supply bonus is very, very useful. As when you're moving a large army around, they often get into places where there's not enough supplies for them and start to starve, which can cause some serious problems. A starving army can get wiped out by it quite quickly. I'm also getting troops into position to be able to have thugs start marching through his territories, taking taking weaker territories in this sort of area, which will be fun. But other than that, it's just more logistics and shuffling people around and kind of just waiting, waiting for stuff to happen. <laughs> so that's kind of really everything I have to say this turn. There's nothing, nothing else really happening. Ah, oh, one other thing is that I did actually remember to forge a... Matrix for Tiazze so that he can join in communions and will be very effective on the battlefield. Anyway, I think that's going to be all for this turn. Well, this turn I don't have much to say about the game, but I do have some hot goss, which I will get to in a moment. First off, uh, there's not very much that's happened, except one very interesting event has occurred, which is that we have gained, completely randomly, a free assassin which is, I'm sure, going to come in incredibly handy. He has ordinary human stats, so his, like, the physical capacities are completely ordinary and nothing special, but he has ethereal, which makes him almost impossible to hit unless you're using a magic weapon. He has stealthy 80, which is huge. I think my wolves are like 40. He has assassin level 3, which means he's very likely to get an assassination with no bodyguards present. He also has scale walls, which means that he can sneak into castles and assassinate commanders inside castles while they are under siege. And he has ambidextrous, which means he can uh, carry multiple weapons, which probably won't be that useful because he's only got human stats. So if I use him as an assassin, which I obviously will, I will probably give him a minion and a bow. It's a running joke in Dominion's communities that higher level assassinations in, you know, the late game tend to look more like Pokemon battles than, you know, assassinations. Because the most effective thing you can do is to give them multiple items which summon creatures because then, and this is something that people forget about in not just this game, but in tons of games, action economy is key. Having to fight two things is exponentially more difficult than having to fight one thing. The more things there are, the more your attention is split, and if you can only hurt one of them at a time, then the rest of them can always whittle you down. I talk about this a lot when I play Dark Souls. <laughs> but what that means is that, you know, you get a couple of, like, pocket elementals, a necklace that summons a skeleton every round, a contract that summons demons every round, then you send them in and they just summon a whole bunch of stuff and those guys do the fighting for you. But the main thing is that he's, he's so stealthy that he will not like be likely to be caught out by patrollers. So that's going to come in very handy. Other than that, logistics are pretty much the same. I'm sort of bumping people around trying to get everybody in position so that we can march straight into all of this juicy, juicy territory as soon as, uh, as, soon as we get the opportunity. I'm also recruiting a ton of wolf riders all over the place. I'm actually declining to recruit one or two wizards this turn just so I can get more wolf riders around because I really need to do some scouting. And uh, these armies will need gem carriers as well. In addition to that, I'm having a few of my casters cast Black Servant, which summons a very fast, nearly invisible ghost thing sort of guy that you can basically send through someone's territory and it will never get spotted. <laughs> I am also planning to do a very underhanded tactic, which involves a specific item, which is an amulet that causes plagues. Everybody in the province gets diseased, including the person carrying it. Well, guess what? The undead are immune to disease. It's not uncommon tactic to put one of those on a stealthy character and send them into your opponent's capital, and then their capital just loses tons and tons of population every turn, so the value goes down. This is less than ideal if you want to take it for yourself, but in the mid to late game where you aren't necessarily going to go to war with someone, but they are a major threat, you can use this to cause all sorts of trouble. Which brings me to the drama. So, <laughs> man took a province off of Pangaea. Pangaea instantaneously denounced him as an NAP breaker. This then led to a huge argument in the chat channel, 
because Mann maintained that as part of the negotiation during the, the agreement to end their NAP, he had said that he was going to take that one immediately. Pangaea didn't say, hey, no, don't do that, that's against the terms of our NAP, and therefore was tacitly, tacitly accepting that this would be done. Pangaea's side of the argument is... Well, obviously, I assumed he meant as soon as the NAP cooldown period is gone, then he would take it. They both miscommunicated with each other, but the fact that instead of discussing this with Man, Pangaea instantly jumped into the chat and instantly denounced him, instead of trying to solve it in negotiation, instead of trying to talk it through in the back channels, which is generally what one is supposed to do. You don't have to, but that's the sporting option. If you go nuclear at step one people will trust you less and also nobody will really have your back or take your side in the argument. So the two of them, this became a really huge spat and they got really quite heated in the chat channel to the point where a moderator had to step in. And basically the moderator's opinion was you both behaved badly here. Man, you should have been more clear about what you were saying. Pangea, you should have said something. You should have spoken up. And uh, when man took that province, you should have talked to him privately first and, and figured out what was going on instead of jumping straight into public denunciations. So frankly, I'm delighted because now everyone thinks that, that Pangaea is kind of a whiny piss baby, which is exactly the opinion I want people to have of Pangaea because fuck Pangaea. Like, screw you. Like, elfed my entire kingdom away in one turn. And, I'm, and so I've been sitting here reading this and I've been thinking, my politicking has been directly responsible for this occurrence. And I'm very pleased with myself. The other side benefit of that is that in a couple of turns, when I move my forces in here one earlier than he, one turn earlier than he thinks I'm going to, if he complains and said I've broken the NAP, I can go, I didn't break the NAP. I announced it on this turn and I made my hostile actions on that turn. Exactly the correct amount of time has passed, which is true. I believe I mentioned this in previous turns, but, um, he, he was he was saying that it was underhanded of me to wait too late in the turn to tell him I was ending the NAP. Maybe it is underhanded, but it's completely legal under the generally assumed rules of NAPs, and lots of people do that. So if he says I've broken the NAP, I can say I literally did not. You're you're doing this again? You're kind of making a name for yourself as someone who who spuriously denounces people, huh? So that I think is everything I need to talk about this turn. And in a couple of turns now, uh, I think one more, I think next turn we can start scripting and for it to resolve the turn after. I will double check that between now and then, obviously, but that's going to be all from me for today. Hello friends, it is turn 50. What an anniversary. And for the turn 50 special, I have absolutely nothing whatsoever to show you. This is the penultimate turn of our sort of awkward logistical shuffling before our attacks are going to be uh, resolving on... Eternal Thorn in my side, appropriate enough, Pangaea. We've had our third global cast. This is uh, also a generator spell, which generates death gems, I believe. Unfortunately, I have never had the gems all the time to get one of those set up. Other than that, not really any news, except that we've had an unfortunate event where a neutral army has attacked one of our provinces and destroyed the patrolling force there, which is a bit irritating. That's an investment of... 10-ish gems, I think. Actually, the bears might put this up to like 18, so that's quite a lot of gems lost just through an unfortunate event. Luckily, we can see that there's 16 knights, so this shouldn't be too difficult to deal with, and I'm, you know, I was shuffling an army around waiting to send it into enemy territory anyway, so they can just be retasked to deal with that and then head into enemy, enemy territory on later turns, which is what they would be doing anyway. Other than that, there's really no other, no other news on here, and there is just a bunch more logistical shuffling. Pangaea has been slightly, slightly snippy once or twice more in the group chat, saying, see, see, man wasn't trustworthy after all. So presumably over, over here, if man's territory stretches far enough, these two are currently at war on this side. Either that or slightly out of my vision, he's taken some territories up here. We have got a few new scouts going on. They're going to go scouting. We've got our assassin slowly being prepped to be a good assassin. I'll send him along with the armies and stuff, and he can do a bunch of, you know, pick-offs of a, of a sieged army. That should be pretty effective. My desperate search for earth gems and air gems continues as I shuffle some guys around. I'll want to get them back in position to join the armies for proper war when proper war begins. But for now, they may as well grab me a few extra sites. And this guy will, of course, need to pass through a laboratory province to pick up his uh, matrix so that he can actually be useful in an army. And he will be very useful with these skills of his. 
straight up don't have anything further to say. It's kind of a, a boring turn, frankly. It's just, uh, just waiting. Really, we're all just waiting on turn 51 when my attacks into Pangaea will start and we'll be able to seize a lot of territory very fast, hopefully. Each of these two armies should be taking one territory a turn while marching towards high value targets. And my three of these guys should be able to just bounce around taking single provinces by themselves. So that should be up to five provinces a turn I can take with a bit of luck. And that's not counting whatever my wolf riders get up to since they are going to be sneaking in the back way and trying to take some of these provinces. So that's going to be all for today, I think. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe and share. I also stream regularly on Twitch and you can find me on Twitter for updates and announcements. If you want to contribute to my continued existence, then why not donate to me on Coffee or Patreon? All of the links are in the description. Thank you so much for watching.